In 1963, an inmate at the Holmesburg prison in Philadelphia by the name of Al Zabala would hear of studies being conducted by the University of Pennsylvania. These studies included a range of different tests, such as powders, eye drops, face creams, deodorant, toothpaste, and liquid diets. Depending on the duration of the test, an inmate could expect to leave with between $10 to $300. At the time, the jobs offered to inmates included making shoes and clothing or working in the plumbing store. These jobs were hard to get, and even if you did, your average wage sat at around 15 cents per day. For most inmates, money like this was something you could never expect to earn within the prison. Though Zabala was tempted by this money, he first went a different route and applied as an assistant technician within the unit. After a recommendation from his friend, who was already a technician, Zabala was given a test to prove he could read and write, and once complete, he was hired as a technician, with a monthly salary of $40 to $50 a month, and the option to take part in any tests he wanted. Part of Zabala's job was to mix creams and lotions labelled only by singular numbers or letters. When he asked what the cream or lotion was, or who they were testing them on, the answer was always, we don't know, or we can't tell you. Zabala would notice after these experiments that many of the inmates were left burned or scarred, but felt they had no legal recourse because they had signed releases and waivers. Having seen what these experiments had done to his fellow inmates, Zabala feared participating. But when he heard about a special study being conducted by the army, where the volunteers could make between 1,000 to 1,500, he decided it was too much to walk away from. First, he was asked to fill out a three-page questionnaire, and then given $25. Next, he had an interview with the psych team, where he was paid an additional $50. Each step was lined with a little cash incentive to keep him biding, until he found himself in a room with six other inmates. There, he would be given limited details, asked to sign a release form stating they could not file for any damages, and the next day were injected with a substance Zabala described as 10 times stronger than LSD. After, he would remain in a padded room for 7 days while being monitored by medical staff through a microphone and video camera. For a month after the test, Zabala had to be put on a liquid-only diet because he had trouble swallowing and suffered a constant dry throat. Other test subjects couldn't remember their names, faded in and out of consciousness, excessively punched themselves in the head, or went on long trips envisioning being eaten by giant spiders or living in the 13th century. Once finally released into the prison's general population, the test subjects were reportedly given special badges stating they were not responsible for their actions, and prison staff needed to get medical staff from the University of Pennsylvania if the inmates caused trouble. This example is only one of the many experiments conducted in the Holmesburg prison on predominantly black males. Other experiments included patch tests, where a grid consisting of up to 20 squares was drawn on the inmate's back using thick white hospital tape. In each square, different lotions were applied, and the inmate's back was exposed to different temperatures on a sun lamp for up to 15 to 30 minutes. The grids were then inspected to see if the skin had blistered or how it had reacted. This was repeated each day for 30 days, often resulting in blistering and peeling of the inmate's skin. It would later be revealed, in some of these experiments, the highly toxic chemical dioxin, a key ingredient in Agent Orange, had been used. So now you might be asking yourself, how did all of this start, and who is responsible for it? Well, it first started when the Holmesburg prison pharmacist read a study on ringworm published by Albert Kligman. At this time, fungal infections such as ringworm had been reaching epidemic levels, and the prison itself was struggling with severe outbreaks of athlete's foot. In his study, Albert evaluated the value of new therapies to combat ringworm, but there was a dark side to Albert's study. One that should have been condemned, but was rather praised. Albert's controlled experiment used mentally disabled children as the subjects for their tests and therapies. According to one of Albert's colleagues, he would often joke about these practices and actively encouraged the growth of ringworm by rubbing it into the scalp of the children. He is even quoted telling his colleagues and students, These kids want attention so bad, if you hit them over the head with a hammer, they would love you for it. When Albert entered the Holmesburg prison, he quickly saw its potential as a new stage for his research, telling a reporter in 1966, all I saw before me were acres of skin. 
It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. And what's even crazier is Albert openly admitted years later he had started visiting the prison and testing prisoners without any authorization, saying, I began to go to the prison regularly, although I had no authorization. It was years before authorities knew that I was conducting various studies on prisoner volunteers. Things were simpler then. Informed consent was unheard of. No one asked me what I was doing. It was a wonderful time. Albert justified his actions towards the prisoners, much in the same way he did with the mentally disabled children, stating, Many of the prisoners, for the first time in their lives, find themselves in the role of important human beings. We say to them, you're important, we need you. Once this is established, these guys will knock their brains out to please you. If the experiment doesn't pan out, they get depressed. They become emotionally involved in the projects. The capacity to respond to love is greater than most people realize. I feel almost like a scoundrel, like Machiavelli, because of what I can do to them. These experiments were no secret. Doc's Chemical, one of the largest chemical producers in the world, paid Albert $10,000 to test dioxin's toxicity effects, which resulted in 75 prisoners being exposed to the chemical. The Department of Defense had Albert testing psychoactive drugs on inmates for them. Johnson & Johnson funded a study where asbestos was injected into mostly black inmates to determine if the substance was safe to use in talcum powder. Albert's other experiments saw inmates exposed to other infections such as staph, herpes, and athlete's foot. These prisoners, used as test subjects, lived painful existences long after these experiments. If it wasn't warts, legions, reoccurring rashes, and scarring, it was mental damage, malformity, and lifelong injuries. And what was Albert Kligman's punishment? Well, around 300 former prisoners who were victims to this testing would attempt to sue him, the University of Pennsylvania, and Johnson & Johnson, but it would be dismissed due to the statute of limitations. Albert Kligman would maintain that the testing he did was consistent with the scientific and ethical norms of the era, but would still be denounced by his colleagues and the world. Other than that, Albert paid no compensation faced no legal consequences and only found himself denounced by his peers. On February 2010, at age 93, he would pass away from a heart attack, leaving behind a legacy of unresolved pain and anguish for his victims. But to most of the outside world who have no idea of these experiments, he would be known as the co-inventor of Retin-A, the acne cream and wrinkle remover, which unsurprisingly went through their first tests on the backs and faces of the Holmesburg inmates.